detention in makeshift prisons or DCIM controlled centers, or will be deported, deported back to their countries of origin. And even if refugees and migrants do make it to the seaside departure point, those intercepted in the Mediterranean by the European funded Libyan Coast Guard are pulled back to Libya and detained once more. And within this detention system, migrants and refugees are subjected to squalid conditions, abuse, sexual and gender-based violence, hunger, and lack of basic rights and access to essential services. And we look forward to hearing from the panel of uh, experts on some of these issues. And we are grateful to be joined today by so many distinguished guests. And we're grateful to have in the audience important US officials like John Pinnell, uh, director of USAID's Libya program operating, operating out of the Libya external office in Tunis. Um, so for now, um, I would just like to introduce John Pinnell. He is a career member of the US Senior Foreign Service and is a country representative for USAID in Libya. Uh, prior to assuming this position, he served as the Deputy Mission Director of the USAID Regional Mission in, um, to Ukraine and Belarus from 2015 to 2019, helping to oversee the agency's largest mission in the region and its efforts to counter malign Russian influence. Uh, for now, um, John, if the floor is yours if you'd like to talk about the U.S. government's position and USAID's work in Libya. Over to you. So John hasn't joined us yet as a panelist. I don't know if you're in the audience. Maybe. No problem then. We can go ahead and just actually introduce the moderator. So to guide us. That's okay, but today, if he's here, if he's here, let's see if he can um, he can promote okay. it. Do we know if he's here? I don't see his name. I don't know if there's Middle East. I don't know if that's possibly. I'm assuming that's an organization. Yeah. So he's not here yet? I didn't see that he's here yet. I think we can just. Well, he's more than welcome to join us at the end. Yeah. So after, okay. So right. then I, to guide us through this discussion is our moderator for today's event, Dr. William Lawrence. And Dr. Lawrence is an expert in his own right, having lived and worked for 15 years as a senior diplomat analyst and international program director in seven countries in the Middle East and North Africa. He is a former State Department uh, Libya desk officer, and he served as officer in charge of Tunisian and Libyan affairs in the U.S. Embassy in Tripoli, where he helped negotiate the first U.S.-Libya bilateral agreement in decades. Previously, Dr. Lawrence also served as the North Africa Director at the International Crisis Group, and he is currently a professor of political science and international affairs at American University. Dr. Lawrence, thank you for joining us today, and over to you. Thank you so much and congratulations to uh, Libyan American Alliance for another uh, uh, timely and important event. Timely, ironically, in the sense that um, the five other Libya events in Washington this weekend that I attended were all on the elections and that's not the only thing going on in Libya and we don't even know if they're gonna happen on the 24th. So I'm really glad that you're paying attention to such a critically important uh, issue. Uh, let me also say, um, that uh, the paper is, 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 is a triumph and uh, congratulations to you guys for producing it. And I hope everyone on the call today that hasn't had a chance to look at it uh, does get a chance. And I'm sure that will be made available uh, to you um, as, as has been um, indicated and promised. Um, uh, by way of introduction, let me just say something quick. Um, in 2013, uh, when I was on a flight from Tunis to Tripoli for crisis group, um, uh, sorry, 2012, um, uh, my, my good friend, uh, Chris Stevens was killed in Benghazi. Um, and uh, uh, following that, one of my many trips to Libya over that period, I wrote a piece in foreign policy called um, something, I think it's Libya's peacekeepers. And the point I was trying to make was that militias were not just bad. Militias were good and bad. We don't have a revolution in Libya without militias. We don't have a, 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 a current political process uh, guaranteed to be more democratic than not right now without militias. And Crisis Group did a 
did a study with small arms survey at the time of all the militias. And we determined that about 80% of them were revolutionary and on the up and up, let's say. About 10% of them were in pro Qaddafi areas and sort of organized um, during and after the revolution um, in the, in the pro Qaddafi areas, which is very much in play right now in the, in their discussions about Libya and about 5% were criminal and about 5% were jihadist. When we talk about militias in Libya now, um, they all are doing different things, although there's some conflation over their roles. But I'd like to say it's the criminal gangs which existed before the revolution, going back to the 90s, if you read some of the books on Libya, drug smuggling gangs, trafficking gangs, they were already there, that continue to create a horrible situation in Libya for the most vulnerable. The second point I'd like to make is that I've worked in foreign affairs now for over 35 years, and sometimes the ethical, moral, and policy issues get confusing. Th things come into conflict. And, and the rubric I always use is when I'm confused or not sure about what position to take or what to take action on or what to think about an issue is how does this thing I'm considering affect the most vulnerable populations? And when that's been taken care of, I feel like I'm on the road to finding the right way forward. It's sort of a bottom-up metric for judging what I'm doing and what my government's doing and what other governments are doing, what the NGOs are doing, et cetera. Uh, and that's why, in many ways, this migrant issue is so important because these are the most vulnerable populations in Libya. They were bombed during the uh, long siege and attack on Tripoli. They are trafficked in the most atrocious ways. They are, um, uh, 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 de they deal with all different kinds of uh, racism and, and degradation and hu humiliation at the hands of European governments who repatriate them to Libya, uh, uh, attacking forces, defending forces, pushed back to their countries. When I was uh, living in Libya uh, in the 2000s, I knew a lot of these migrants of the pre-revolutionary crowd and already things were bad. And with the revolution, they got much, much worse. And I tracked some of the friends of mine as they went back to the Sahel or back to the Horn of Africa or ended up in Europe or got pushed back again. And, and in many ways, the plight of these migrants um, is, a, is, a, is a sad commentary, uh, not on militias or not, but on the international community in general on Europe, Europe's approach to all of Africa and North Africa in particular, and how Libyans deal with their own guest populations. And, and, and as, 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 as the proper reporting on this shows, uh, everyone's guilty and everyone needs to uh, uh, take dramatic actions to improve how they deal with this population. Um, with that, I'd like to um, introduce our um, first panelist, um, the way we're going to structure this is ask them to make some introductory remarks and answer an initial question. Then we're going to do a couple, a couple more rounds of questions, time permitting, and then open it up for audience questions. Uh, and if our um, uh, U.S. government representative uh, 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 can join at, 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 a, at an opportune point, I'm going to rely on Natasha and Fatima to let me know when that's uh, been made possible. Um, so our first um, uh, panelist today is Mark McAuliffe, and I hope I got the pronunciation correctly. He's director of the North Africa and Sahel Observatory at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, where he leads research on organized crime based in, uh, on a field network of more than 180 monitors comprising local journalists, research, and academics established in Libya, Tunisia, Morocco, Southern Algeria, Niger, Chad, Mali, and Sudan. Some of my favorite countries. In fact, I'm teaching a new course at American University this spring on all of those countries, uh, a Maghreb Sahel horn class. Um, uh, and um, um, I'm, I won't go further. He has an illustrious uh, uh, bio here and, and publications, and I'm sure we can make that available to you. The question, two questions for Mark to start is, First, your introductory remarks in answer to the question, can you please discuss the specific challenges you and your organization face while researching transnational crime, human rights abuses, or providing assistance to refugees and migrants? If you want to mention COVID, please feel free. 
And then the directed question for you for this introductory uh, round is, would you please share your observations about the link between detention centers, human trafficking and smuggling networks? How do militias benefit from involvement in detention centers? Mark, the floor is yours. I have five minutes for all that, right? <laughs> <laughs> we'll give you five and a half. <laughs> Okay, I'll skip the introduction. So the Global Initiative, very, very quickly, is a very young organization, really, um, that set out to um, be a bit of a, a disruptor. Um, so looked at the UN system, thought there was a lot of good, but, but felt that there wasn't a connection between sort of governments, law enforcement, and, and that sort of framework, and civil society. Both of these are needed for any solution. Um, but very often tend not to communicate. And, and I'm using this introduction because I think it's useful also to, to sort of understand where I'm coming from and, and, and why I'm looking at, at the situation and the way I, I do. So also very brief background on myself also so you know where I'm coming from. Um, in my former incarnation as an investigative journalist, I, I covered Libya for before the revolution, during the revolution, and 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 after the revolution, and I have been, I have been researching human smuggling in particular in 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 Libya um, since the, the turn of the century, since this phenomenon really caught anyone's attention, um, and and that gives me the benefit of a historic perspective, which I think is is necessary because yes. The revolution is a very, very important uh, 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 determining point, uh, which changed uh, 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 dynamics. But also, um, there are uh, very significant uh, uh, trends, which ultimately have remained the same. In fact, yeah. it, it, in reality, if you really boil down, especially when we're looking at the, the predation of migrants, the exploitation of migrants, including the, what happens to them in, in detention centers, um, the, 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 the basic premise or, or the basic um, uh, uh, narratives uh, uh, that come from, from uh, migrant victims haven't changed really. It's very sad, but it hasn't changed. Uh, I, I've interviewed migrants back in 2005, 2006, um, who've given me very similar stories to migrants that I've interviewed in, in 2014. What has changed, and this is very important and it comes to your, your initial question, is first of all, the scale um, of the system, the scale of the exploitation, and the extent of the predation. Um, and, and, and that was in its largest part, the result of the proliferation of militias after the, the revolution. So that is responsible, first of all, for the industrialization of human smuggling and trafficking in Libya. Without militias, the, the, there wouldn't have been the scale expansion that we saw um, post 2012-2013, and, and it can be traced back to uh, uh, very specific uh, turning points. Um, and also, we wouldn't have seen the expansion in the capacity and logistics of the human smuggling industry. Now, one qualification, I would broadly agree with, with, the, with the initial classification or, or on the categorization of, of militias, um, with one proviso, which is, yes, the, the, the number of purely criminal outfits that fall within the, the umbrella of militias in Libya are, are few. However, they are accompanied by, you know, a, a large majority of militias that many of them are actually quasi-official and, and now have assumed the role of a state function, which protect various types of criminal activities. Um, and this leads me to the question of detention centers. The, the most problematic and most alarming element uh, concerning the, the, the exploitation of migrants in detention center 
and the most pernicious relates to this, which is the fact that, especially after 2017, when, when, when association of militias with human smuggling became rather toxic and, and a number of militias actively retreated from the direct involvement in, in putting people on boats, to be clear, um, many of them switched to a, a, a law enforcement or uh, related to uh, human smuggling. And, and started capitalizing on, on their involvement in, in the migration management business. And detention centers are a very, very important locus in this. So a militia running a detention center or protecting a detention center, um, and there are several of these, um, in the process, um, overseeing a system where migrants are uh, uh, routinely asked for ransoms, routinely sort of loaned into the, 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 the industry, made to work for, for little or, or no money, actually. Um, and all of these process, proceeds going back to, to, to militias, many of which, as I said, um, now have a, a, a state function and, and actually are either part of the Ministry of Interior, part of, part of the Ministry of Defense, uh, so on and so forth. And uh, this is important to highlight because this is part and parcel of, of, of the, the political discussion. And uh, in a further sort of uh, outlook into 2022, whether or not the elections are, are, are held or not, um, when a stable government is in place that has the, the legitimacy um, required to, to, to operate in the international setting, this is definitely this definitely should be one of the priorities um, to 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 be to be tackled um, going forward, and and which really and truly is enmeshed in in in, in broader problems that that Libya has with the the, the role of of armed groups um, and and their intersection with the state. I think I'll I'll stop there. I don't know if I answer. Thank you, Mark, for very enlightened opening comments. Um, uh, let me say in response uh, that the name of the article that I'd forgotten the title of is called Libya's Forgotten Peacekeepers. And, and my point was, uh, among others in the article and in my introductory remark, is that it was militias that were defending the U.S. mission in Benghazi uh, that tried to rescue and revive Chris Stevens against jihadist militias that were attacking. You know, so we have to kind of understand. And I totally agree with your point, Mark, that of the 80 percent of the, what we might call the the revolutionary militias with best intentions, there's been a lot of slippage towards predation. Uh, the point I was trying to make there is that in, the, in, an, in an apocalyptic year like 2019, you know, if you're in a detention center in Tripoli getting bombed, you know, who, 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 are, you, who, who are you being subjected to uh, horrific conditions by? The militia detaining, uh, um, defend, uh, detaining you or the militia bombing you? And my contention would be both militias uh, rather than the militias of the West. That, that was sort of my point. Um, um, uh, great opening comments. I'm gonna move on to uh, Thomas Garofalo, um, who is the International Rescue Committee's uh, Libya country director and has experienced directing programs in diverse humanitarian and development contexts across Latin America, Europe, and the Middle East. His organization, the IRC has been present in Libya since 2016, where they provide life-saving health and protection services, support wider health system strengthening efforts, and are building the capacity of Libyan youth in peace building and governance initiatives. And for your introductory remarks, I'd like you to answer that same first question about discussing the specific challenges you and your organization face while researching transnational crime, investing human rights abuses, or providing assistance to refugees and migrants. And then your directed question, first question, would you tell us about the conditions faced by migrants and refugees at disembarkation points and inside detention centers and what IRC is doing to support them? Um, uh, Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bill. And, and uh, I wanna thank the, the Alliance as well, the Libyan American Alliance. It's, it's really uh, it's good to be a part of this panel. Um, and I look forward to, to reading your report. It seems extremely timely. Um, uh, as you said, William, uh, the IRC is, uh, is an international humanitarian agency and crisis response organization. Um, and we work in about 40 countries. 
really along the whole arc of the crisis because we work in many countries in conflict, they're recovering from conflict, but we are also very involved as partners of the US government and other governments in, in the resettlement enterprise, bringing people from situations of conflict who have, who have uh, been granted asylum and refugee status to, to make new lives in, in other countries. So really we're present along the entire uh, span of, of the situation. And so um, today we're talking about Libya. You mentioned that we have uh, history since 2016 of working in Libya and, and um, only part of our work is with migrants and refugees and working with uh, populations in detention um, we started in Libya in 2016 as a very operational health response organization and since have grown with um, the Ministry of Health, which in spite of the conflict and many challenges has continued to try and provide health services, public health services and other services to, to Libyan and non-Libyan populations and, um, and uh, in spite of everything has been able to, to continue forward. Um, we, um, today we're focusing on migrants and refugees and uh, it's, it's very timely right now. In fact, I'm just getting WhatsApp messages from our teams who are working, uh, responding to disembarkations of people who have been intercepted at sea and are being returned by the Libyan Coast Guard right now. There's two happening uh, 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 simultaneously, which is not unusual. And that points to one of the many challenges that we face, that the sheer pace of, of returns has been, has been very high. Um, we also work in uh, trying to support migrants and refugees to access health care and other services in the urban community. And, and the, the population in, my, in, in detention is very small. Uh, right now, it's, it's only about 5,000 in official uh, Libyan authority run uh, detention centers. But um, there's hundreds of thousands of non Libyans who are uh, present in Libya, uh, many of them uh, have just come for to, to live. L Libya has often been a destination country of, of people who have been on the move fleeing conflicts or fleeing economic privations, now fleeing climate change uh, and come to Libya. And then once they're in Libya and they face the predation and, and other hardships that, uh, that come with a lack of a legal framework and, and lack of status, they frequently decide to try and, and flee to, to Europe. Um, so this year, um, we have had, we've seen a vast increase in the number of people who are trying to take to the Mediterranean Sea and that very dangerous passage to, to, to flee to Europe. Um, in the entire year of 2020, there were only, well, only, there were 11,900 or so people who tried this dangerous path. In 2021, we've seen about 31,000. So it's a vast increase. Part of the increase is because for much of 2020, there was a war going on that, that uh, disrupted some of this flow of people. Um, but it, it also proves that in spite of COVID, in spite of- uh, Just to qualify, just a, um, a, a quick check, fact check. Um, is that the highest ever or, or have there been worse years, that 31,000 level? You know, I might defer to Mark. I think that's pretty much, uh, there may have been higher numbers before, but, um, Certainly, in, since I've been here in 2018, that's that's the highest that we've seen. Thank you. So that means that we've had because uh, we don't we are responding to these um, disembarkations in four sites, but but really only two that are very heavily trafficked uh, in Tripoli, um, and we have responded to about 175 disembarkations in uh, in this year so far. The year's not quite over. Um, a mix of, uh, of nationalities. There are about 40 different nationalities of, of, of migrants and refugees who are present in Libya. So people from all over the world, from Bangladesh to Mali and, and to uh, Eritrea and Ethiopia, um, Syria, uh, Sudan, many from Sudan. That's probably the highest, the highest population of Sudanese. So the sheer number is, is certainly a challenge. Um, they, they are suffering in so many different ways. When they're returned uh, from by the Libyan Coast Guard, they, they usually are uh, intoxicated from, from the fuel, the fumes of the fuel. They, they, may, they may be uh, suffering from, um, from, from cold. Uh, they they uh, are always traumatized, not just from the, from the, uh, the ordeal at sea, but often from from suffering from rape and, and extortion and violence all along the way before Libya, in Libya, and, um, 
and when they're and when they're intercepted as well. Um, and then they're they're brought. We we have a very short window to do some medical referrals and um, and treat them. Uh, and, and then they are sent to a, a sort of a processing center and then farmed out to a variety of uh, detention centers that are run by the, the DCIM that, that you mentioned. Um, there's no systematic registration of these people. So they frequently, uh, we, we lose track of them. Sometimes we see them once we are able to go to detention centers to provide assistance there. But that's one of the challenges we have. And the other, the other big challenge is that so many of them disappear. Uh, I mentioned that 31,000 were returned. Um, we were able to assist about 23,000 of those, um, but yet there's there's fewer than 5,000 of them in detention. And so the, the question that's obvious is where where do they go? What happens to them? Um, what's their status? And, and there are many different ways where they, they can uh, uh, leave detention. Um, uh, Mark, you know, we, we rely so much on the analysis that, um, that his organization is doing, and they've been a really important uh, voice in, the, in, in this discussion here. Um, and he points out the ways that uh, they can buy their way out, some escape, um, uh, but it's, it's, uh, they are ransomed, uh, as Ian has talked about in his article. Um, it, so it's, uh, it's difficult. And I think that that points to the, the other point I wanted to make is that while there is no legal framework and there's no status for these people, there doesn't seem to be a way out of this right now. And, and so for our staff, I, I, I'm concerned about them because really it's, it's kind of hopeless that they see these populations um, return to Libya. Uh, often they lose everything in that attempt because it costs money and, and, and they're so vulnerable to, to extortion. And, and then they, they have no choice but to try again. You know? and, and I didn't mention the, the numbers of people who have died. 1,300 people in, in 2021 alone were, were lost at sea. Um, so, yeah, I mean, those are some of the, the, uh, the, the challenges that, that we see. Perhaps I can leave it there. I don't know if I answered the second question, but I'm happy to try again. Yeah. You're good for now. And, and um, I knew this wasn't gonna be a happy panel, uh, but the, 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 the scale of what we're talking about is just devastating to hear about. And thank you for portraying it so, um, so helpfully for our, for our audience. I'm gonna move on to Ian Urbina now. Um, and Ian uh, is um, place, and now I found him. He's an investigative reporter who I first saw on MSNBC quite recently, uh, 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 based in Washington. His most recent series, The Outlaw Ocean, chronicles the diversity of crimes offshore, including the killing of stowaways, sea slavery, international dumping, illegal fishing, the stealing of ships, gun running, stranding of crews and murder with impunity. He's reported from Africa, Asia, Europe, South America, and the Middle East, uh, uh, much of that time spent on fishing ships. Mr. Bean has also written extensively on criminal justice issues, including stories about the use of prisoners for pharmaceutical experiments, uh, immigrant detainees uh, um, uh, working on paid solitary confinement and immigration detention facilities, and the dependence of the US Defense Department on prison uh, labor. Um, I'll, I'll leave the rest of his bio for uh, discovery later. I'm sure we can make it available. Um, Ian, I'm going to start with the, uh, one of the same questions and then a directed question at you. Uh, can you please discuss the specific challenges you faced while researching transnational crime, investigating human rights abuses, providing assistance to refugees and migrants? And for you, uh, in developing your article, The Secret of Prisons That Keep Migrants Out of Europe, is there a specific story or movement that sticks out to you? Yeah, so just some context. So um, uh, as you mentioned, um, the reporting I do is now based at a nonprofit called the Outlaw Ocean Project, which is a sort of ProPublica style news organization. The reason I'm on this panel is because of a story two weeks ago published in the New Yorker that looked at the migration challenge in Libya and detention facilities. Um, to your specific question, um, I would say, um, you know, we, uh, I took a team to Libya to report on this story. Uh, this was the second stint on this overall topic. I had done a piece previously for the Atlantic about um, Italian government's 
leasing of seven large cruise ships to house 10,000 migrants offshore, ostensibly to quarantine them, but also additionally to vet them and decide what to do with them and to keep them away from reporters and advocates and the like. Um, in reporting on that uh, story and getting on those vessels, um, the harrowing tales that everyone here already knows about what was happening in Libya sort of decided for me what the next investigation should be. So uh, in May, I took a team of, of four of us to Libya to take a look specifically at um, one facility, Al Mabani, which means the buildings, which is the newest and largest and most notorious of the official detention facilities, and a specific murder that occurred in that facility to some degree meant to be synecdoche of a larger tale of the kind of quintessential climate migrant and, and how they sometimes end up in uh, these facilities. Um, the, the other question, um, Dr. Lawrence, that you raised, um, I might jump to because it's more interesting, but to, to answer your first question, uh, we were taken captive by a militia and, and disappeared into a prison and held for quite some time and pretty severely abused. So clearly of, of uh, moments that I remember acutely, um, that uh, part of our reporting effort um, will stick with me forever. Um, truth be told, I don't like to discuss it a lot because um, what happened to us and my team pales in comparison uh, to what's happening routinely uh, to hundreds and thousands of migrants in Libya who are disappeared and, and, and uh, treated far worse than we were and don't, uh, many of them don't make it out. Um, so uh, certainly our captivity was um, the moment in our reporting that uh, stuck with me most. Thank you, Ian. I'm going to stick with you and just also mention quickly that my longtime friend, uh, Anthony Shadid, was also taken prisoner in, in Libya and had a very similar position towards his imprisonment as you. It spoke, you know, you know what I'm saying, in a sort of similar way about not wanting to talk about it, but it also being harrowing. Um, and and uh, I also should have mentioned that you have a Pulitzer and a Polk and hopefully our audience uh, 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 viewing you today is, 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 can say I knew you when you before you got the next award for this tremendous feat of reporting that you did um, uh, in the New Yorker. And I'm hoping if it hasn't already been done that Natasha or Fatima can put a link to the article in the chat. Um, uh, the second directed question for you, Ian, because you have to leave early and I, I'll ask Ahmed to bear with me while I, I, I help him because he has to leave early. Uh, how can Europe be incentivized to shift their involvement in the migrant and refugee crisis to actually protect migrants and refugees? Uh, it's a really good question. Um, and let me just say a couple of things. One, Anthony Shadid was an editor of mine before I joined the New York Times 20 years ago. Um, uh, I worked on the Middle East and uh, Anthony Shadid was on the board of the directors at the think tank where I was based. He's an amazing journalist. He was an amazing journalist, um, uh, much as you know, uh, Bill. Um, I also just want to say a quick thanks to Mark and Tom, who were amazing guides and tutors in the reporting, um, uh, sort of helping me make sure I get it right when I reported this piece for the New Yorker. Um, uh, so uh, I, I want to sort of publicly thank them for all that. Um, with regard to your question, um, I think it, there, there are uh, multiple layers, um, and they might feel like a hodgepodge list. Um, my outlook here on things that could change are um, differing in altitude. One is, I do think that um, uh, the rhetoric um, that presently exists and fogs the space a bit, obscures the reality, needs to be confronted. So things like the reference to what's happening on the Mediterranean and the EU role um, and referring to those as rescues uh, as opposed to arrests is a fundamental problem in the overall public understanding. These are arrests. Most of these are occurring in international waters. They're occurring at the, against the will of migrants. Uh, they are being uh, picking up people and taking them back to a place that has been officially designated not a port of safety. These are not rescues. Um, and so I think, um, I think we all as a public need to really think clearly and soberly about that. I think um, furthermore, um, there is a, a sleight of hand, a rhetorical sleight of hand that I think certain folks in the EU are, have used for far too long in referencing the EU role on the Mediterranean and with regard to the abuses in the migrant uh, migration centers 
um, which is to say we in the EU, you know, don't build, we don't arm, we don't uniform those guards at the migration, at the detention centers. That's not our deal. You know, look to the Libyan government, it's their fault. And really what's happening there is terrible, but we can't do anything about it. I think that's really disingenuous. And I think more aggressive con confronting of that rhetoric and saying, yes, but the raison d'etre of the migration centers is the very return policy that you've uh, enabled through the Libyan Coast Guard. Those wouldn't exist. Surely they existed under Qaddafi and they were not pleasant places then. There was, there's always been those, but the, the filling of them is an EU creation uh, and the EU is very involved with everything around them from the tablets to count, you know, counting the migrants to the buses that carry them to the detention centers and in so many other ways that we found. So I think that's the other thing, but there's a laundry list of other key ways in which EU policy could change. And some of them are already in motion, you know, um, litigation against Frontex. You know, Frontex puts the drones and planes over the Mediterranean, providing the coordinates to member states, Italy, Malta, that then often gets handed off the Libyan Coast Guard. Libyan Coast Guard then goes and picks them up. If there wasn't that intel, um, the return policy would not be half as deadly and effective. And that's a e EU creation. Um, the weaponization of port administration, doctors out borders and other ships that are actually doing true humanitarian rescues have a very harrowing time trying to do their work because of the way that ports on the European side handle them when they, when they come back to shore. And that's a decided policy and that could easily change. Um, uh, so these are just a couple of the examples. I mean, the IMO, for example, approved the change in status of Libyan search and rescue zone and expanded its realm, which has given cover to the Libyan Coast Guard to say, you know, back off, even though we're in international waters, back off doctors without borders. These are, you know, we have jurisdiction here. And if you in, in, get in our way, bad things will happen. We'll open fire, we're very aggressive moves. They're outside of their national waters and they're invoking jurisdiction that has been sort of handed to them by the UN, by the International Maritime Organization that should have never been handed to them. So these are all ways in which if key players in Europe wanted to try to disrupt the current really abusive and efficient system of return to Libyan detention centers. These are just some of them that could be um, employed. And to your question before about statistics, 2015 saw a half a million refugees and migrants cross the Mediterranean. So these numbers are, have been quite large in recent years, much larger than they are now in terms of overall flow. Thank you, because I thought that was the case, but I, I said 2016, so thank you for um, being specific on that. I'm sure most of our panelists could have answered that question, but um, um, <clears throat> let me give you one more, Ian. Um, sorry, I was something I wanted to say. Oh, I just said, um, calling the Libyan Coast Guard a Coast Guard, and I've been doing a recent project with um, the US Coast Guard, it's just not the right term. I think if we had a term that meant militia and Coast Guard and the, the negative definition militia using a, uh, for some of the militias in my introductory remarks, uh, then we have a word closer to what the Libyan Coast Guard is. Um, the last question to Ian, and, and I hope Ian, you can stay as long as you can to listen to Ahmed, um, US and the international community do to protect these vulnerable populations and hold those facilitating the cycle of violence accountable. Look, you know, I often say reporters don't know anything. They just know people that know things. And two of them are on this call, uh, Mark and Tom. Uh, and so I turn to my tutors in moments like this and say, well, what do you think? You know, what, what is the appropriate answer here? Smart people I talk to on this tough question, and it is a tough question, say two things that I regurgitate. One is um, a bit more um, ambitious and big picture. And the other is a a bit more applied and perhaps real world. My sense is the real world, one real world more immediate way to potentially uh, reduce harm in these detention facilities might be to squeeze for the EU to squeeze pressure on the Libyan Coast Guard and that revenue stream uh, as a method to get the Libyan government to pay attention to the serious concerns about what's happening on land to these migrants when they're returned. Um, I'm not sure, again, as counseled by sources, that um, the EU has as much leverage 
over the militias and the federal authorities, DCIM, that run the detention centers. You know, Tom and, and others are working hard to do harm reduction in those facilities. Um, but in terms of really cleaning them up and getting more eyes in there, um, I think the pressure that could be applied probably goes through the Libyan Coast Guard. Um, so that's one thing I've heard that sounds convincing. Um, the other thing is a bit more meta and may sound quixotic or idealistic and implausible, but I do think if you're looking at a global stampede like climate migration, and you're looking at 150 million people over the next 50 years having to relocate, and you're looking at how this problem is gonna increase, and you're thinking that your solution, whether it's US government on the Mexican border, funneling money there to sort of southernize our border and stop migrants from reaching the US border, or the EU via Italy in Libya, outsourcing your policing of migration to failed states is a terrible idea. And, um, in, and dedicating so much of your funding towards symptoms rather than causes, more guys with guns, more SUVs in the deserts, more patrol vessels, rather than trying to look more at the push factors in Guinea-Bissau, like our main character, you know, that are causing a lot of these folks to head to Libya. Again, that sounds pie in the sky and easy for me to say, say, but I do think we probably have to think at that altitude if we're gonna really try to get to root causes of so many people tra traveling. Well, I'd like to thank the rest of the panel for watching me because because of Ian's schedule with uh, giving him some extra time here and for being excellent teachers. And I'd like to congratulate Ian for being an excellent student uh, and an excellent communicator of, of, uh, of, of the horrific uh, uh, context and conditions that uh, so many thousands of victims are going through. I'd like to turn to Ahmed. Um, uh, Ahmed El Gassir is a dedicated human rights and environment activist. He co-founded Human Rights Solidarity, HRS, in December 1999 in Switzerland. He's currently a senior human rights researcher and program planner at HRS. He's represented at several international human rights events, including side events at the meeting of Assembly of States Parties to the Rome Status of the International uh, Criminal Court, ICC, in October 2014 at the UNH headquarters in New York and at a workshop organized by ICC and about the role of ICC in supporting the capacity of the national uh, judiciary in Libya. Um, I will uh, turn to Ahmed without um, reading the rest of his long um, uh, uh, bio and his excellent publications, which I hope LA can make available to those interested. Um, same opening question to you, Ahmed. Uh, what are the specific challenges you and your organization face while researching everything we're talking about? And a directed question for you, Ahmed, since you work directly with migrants and refugees on the ground in Libya, can you tell us about what's happened with the UNHCR sit-ins? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Ian for his uh, excellent article. Timely, uh, came in uh, really in a good time. Um, our organization, we've been working uh, as a human rights organization. Uh, we've been working on the issue of the, of the refugees uh, since 2016. Specifically, we started uh, doing uh, field visits to the, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, detention centers where our uh, associates, they go there, uh, uh, you know, visit and sit with the, with the detainees. Uh, listen, uh, you know, check on their uh, situation and so on. And then we we report, we report to the UN uh, mechanisms, uh, cases like, you know, for example, uh, cases of, of, of uh, very vulnerable people that they need uh, uh, attention uh, because of their situation, especially the sick or the, or the, uh, the women, uh, young mothers with, with babies that they don't have any uh, you know, uh, medical assistance or uh, food for the babies. They don't provide them in the detention centers, by the way. It's, uh, you know, they, they, they either provide for themselves or uh, some orga humanitarian organization comes up with that. Uh, but we, we, we've been reversing, we've seen it. The situation of the refugees in Libya is that they are in a country which is not party to the convention for the refugees, nor it is party to the 
uh, to the, the protocol for the status of refugees in 1966-67 uh, protocol. And so there is no, in Libya, there is no uh, uh, legal, uh, what do you call it, uh, protections for the refugees recognizing this status. So they are there in, 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 in the limbo completely. And, uh, and, uh, and they have no protection. Uh, the and Libyan Libyan uh, legislation they don't have, uh, for example, a, a, a legislation for uh, for refugees status for how to process them, how to grant them refugee status. There is no nothing there. Uh, and 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 uh, and what happened on this uh, sitting uh, in uh, outside the office of the of the uh, uh, what they call the community day center uh, run by the UNHCR in in uh, in uh, in uh, Saraj area, which is uh, suburb which is Tripoli, is that on the first of October there were mass arrests targeting uh, refugees, migrants in Tripoli, especially in the in, in the old city and on, in in another uh, district. Libyan authorities acknowledged four thousand detained. Uh, the IOM reported 4,100 in, in something like, you know, a couple of days, they, they detained them. And then, but all this group in a, in a, in a detention center, crowded, nothing there. Uh, for a week, they were, they, were, uh, they were in a very uh, bad situation. So uh, the, some of them broke out, hundreds of them actually broke out. We don't know exact number. Uh, that was on the 8th of, uh, of October, eight, uh, seven days after they had been arrested. And then on the 9th, they went in front of the, uh, and the, on the office of the UNCR, you know, trying to bring attention to their situation. What led to that is that the Libyan authorities suspended the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the evacuation flights that were uh, run by the IOM to, to, uh, to return uh, what they call the uh, the voluntary return humanitarian return uh, flights return uh, migrants who want to return to their countries they stopped that and also the flights that uh, were organized by the UNHCR to uh, relocate uh, refugees to either a third country safe countries like they've been doing uh, 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 relocating them to uh, to uh, to uh, uh, East Africa, to, uh, uh, not Burundi, the other country, uh, and then and then from there they will find you know process them and to a third uh, the final uh, relocation country. That was suspended for more than a year before October, so they were stuck there without any. And 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 and, and, and in this, this these people became uh, in a hopeless situation. And now they are being now since uh, 8th of October until today, they are still sitting there. Uh, they, their numbers are around from 700 to uh, 1500. They gather there in the open. There is, no, there is not a single organization, international organization. UNCR closed its office in front of the, door, the doors, closed the doors, did not want to accept them in. And uh, and uh, and no other uh, no other organizations providing them with service. They are in the open air, and now the UNHCR last week announced to them that, that they will be uh, closing the office. The CDC is called the the care community day center. Uh, they will be closing it, and any uh, humanitarian assistance will be uh, provided through its uh, its. Uh, its uh, partner organizations like the IOM or the other organizations that they help. The problem, another issue for the H uh, UNHCR is that it has only a, a one office in Libya, and that's in, in Tripoli. Uh, it does not provide any support for the for for for, uh, for refugees in other parts of Libya, uh, and it provides only one number, uh, telephone number for refugees to contact. And now, according to the UNHCR, there are uh, something like 41,000 uh, registered refugees there uh, without any support. This is what led to this uh, sit-ins. And I think in, on, on, the 10th, on the 31st of December, their situation, because those who are coming outside, who lost their uh, belongings in the raids, who have lost the, uh, the whatever uh, you know, accommodation, 
that they were sort of like uh, sheltering in, 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 in especially in Gergarsh, they will be in, uh, they, they will have to, uh, to be evicted because the, uh, the, the UNSCR will be handing over the premises and then they will have, I don't know where they will go. Their situation in Libya is very bad. I mean, I'm not talking about the, uh, the, the, what goes on in the, in the detention centers, which I will just remark that most of them, most of them are run by militias, even those that they are under the banner of, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, anti-illegal immigration uh, uh, authority. Most of them are run by, uh, by, by militias. This is the situation of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, refugees. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, I'm, I'm juggling a couple of things here, but I'd like to turn to Mark next. Um, and and, and uh, if you have anything to respond to what was said by the others briefly, but I also have a directed question for you. Uh, what can be done to dismantle the lucrative trade of trafficking and smuggling of refugees and migrants in Libya? Um, dismantling completely is impossible, um, and I think that's that's a very important uh, policy standpoint to start from. Um, disrupting um, and undermining is possible and has been done, uh, not perfectly, um, but but has been done. So there have been various interventions across uh, North Africa and even the Aegean that have damaged. Um, human smuggling networks. And, and this in, in, in some sense also ties into to what you were saying about the good militias and the bad militias. Militias are a reality in Libya. Um, and, and there's, it, it's a reality that's gonna stay there for the foreseeable future. Like we, we need to project 10, 15 years into the future and probably militias in some shape or form will still be part of the Libyan landscape. Um, it's it, The cat is out of the bag and, and, and I don't think we're in a position to, to, to put it back in at, at this stage. So any, any sort of policy formulation needs to account for this. Now, what happened um, in, in the past years is illustrative of, of this as well. So one thing to, to bear in mind is when also when we're talking about figures, um, in 2016, between 2015 and 2017, numbers were uh, 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 on a completely uh, different level. So yes, 2021 was an extremely busy year with, with uh, 57,000 departures from, from, from Libya. Um, that pales in comparison with 2016 when 180,000 migrants left, left Libya. What happened in the, in the interim was that the government of national accord at the time um, intervened to co-opt some militias that were directly involved in human smuggling. And a few of them changed hats and, and turned from, from smugglers to, to, to law enforcement overnight. This is not perfect, so I'm not advocating for, for, for this model, that this model be, be um, uh, 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 taken over um, across all, all of Libya uh, wasn't perfect because a it provoked a war. So in Sabrata there was a war that was precisely triggered by by these events, um, and and some of these militias basically the message through them was was a message of impunity. Basically, that said, considering that militias aren't going to go anywhere uh, anytime soon. This is one of the, the, the sort of broad models that needs to be considered. How are you going to incentivize militias to move away from monetizing the exploitation of migrants and into other areas? Okay. And, and when, you, when you get into this mindset, we can explore a lot of different ideas um, in practice. However, I think the most pressing um, objective for the international community vis-a-vis -vis Libya is to come together 
and agree on some form of charter because I feel that fundamentally, and this doesn't just apply to, to, to smuggling and trafficking, this applies to everything. The biggest problem in respect to Libya right now is that the international community is too, too fragmented. There are too many different players trying to extract too many different objectives in Libya. Some of them to the benefit of sort of the, the Libyan uh, polity as a whole, some of them to the detriment um, of, of the Libyan polity. And unless, and, and all of this is happening in the absence of a sort of leadership role by the European Union or the, the United States um, or any other uh, player um, uh, that, that sort of has a, an engagement with, with Libya. Considering where Libya is at right now, where it is fragmented and where each different player has, you know, uh, 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 literally an armed group backing it, unless there is a, a, a coherent uh, a strategy to tackle Libya's political future, um, progress is always going to be slow. And 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 tackling human smuggling and trafficking is so far down in the list of priorities of what Libya needs to be tackling immediately that that's going to be even slower. Thank you so much, Mark. I understand that um, our, our first um, guest speaker, John Pinnell, has joined us and been promoted to panelist. And if he's unmuted, I'd like to invite him to give up to five minutes of remarks on today's topic. Yes, hello. Thank you very much. And I, I do sincerely apologize for being late. Uh, we're actually at a very interesting time right now uh, in, in Libya. Uh, I think everyone is aware, tracking, you know, the lead up to uh, elections and how that whole process is unfolding. We also have a number of, of visitors at the same time. So things are quite busy at the moment. But I think overall that that's a very good sign. Um, I have been able to hear uh, the panelists so far. And I think we're lucky to have a number of experts uh, who've provided very, very good insights, and we're familiar with, with a number of them already. Uh, I'm the USAID country director for Libya. And although USAID does not support uh, efforts uh, to market specifically, uh, our State Department uh, population refugees and Migration Bureau counterparts do. And we do work very closely in coordination with them on broader humanitarian assistance that focuses not only on migrants, but also refugees and internally displaced persons. And so we recognize this issue, issue is extremely important uh, for the folks involved in today's call, but also for the broader international community, including the United States. So we're re I'm really happy to be on this call. Um, with that, um, I, not to repeat necessarily what others have said, but just a couple of background points, and then I can talk a little bit more about kind of the US government perspective as well. Um, so as we all know, and it has been stated already globally, more broadly speaking, beyond uh, just Libya, you know, irregular migration is a global phenomenon with very horrific human costs. And it requires a comprehensive social, economic, and security response. And in the Libya context, we strongly uh, believe that only a unified central government that's capable of controlling its borders in accordance, of course, with human rights and international humanitarian law can begin to address this very important task. And of course, in cooperation with relevant international organizations and partners, a number of whom we've already heard from uh, previously on the panel. Um, and so for us, as I mentioned, a lot of focus on upcoming elections. Uh, we do believe that these elections offer the only path to establishing a legitimate uh, Libyan government that is capable of playing this role that I just described regarding uh, migrants. Um, we also stand, of course, very much ready uh, to support the Libyan government in creating an appropriate uh, migration governance system. <clears throat> now, specifically, uh, moving on to what the U.S. does and can do, um, we obviously support continued protection and assistance to refugees and asylum seekers in Libya, in addition to regional coordination and training the Libyan government to address irregular migration flows in accordance, of course, with human rights principles and international humanitarian law. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset. Um, U.S. assistance to migrants is designed to abide by the do no harm uh, principle approach, if you will. So we only fund activities that are strictly necessary, ensuring that our assistance does not support you know, current detention structures or detaining authorities and militias. 
Uh, U.S. partners uh, provide reception and registration services for refugees and asylum seekers, distribute essential uh, relief items and cash assistance as well. Um, they also provide equipment and infrastructure support to local healthcare facilities, implement livelihoods and food security programs, and deliver other assistance items to affected populations. Um, just a couple other quick points as well. Um, so we also support longer term migration governance objectives. So including building the capacity of human rights offenders, sorry, defenders, judicial sector actors, training on human rights best practices and helping Libya create resilient laws that are in line with international humanitarian law commitments. We also advocate that Libyan authorities afford UNHCR and IOM with greater access to migrants and refugees, both inside and outside detention centers uh, in order to allow them to uh, deliver critical protection services and life-saving assistance to these vulnerable individuals. Uh, again, I just wanted to thank you all for having me on the panel and I do sincerely apologize uh, for being late, but I have had an opportunity to hear from the other panelists. And uh, like I said, uh, there is a lot of expertise on this call. And so I, I look forward to hearing uh, more during the uh, rest of the call as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. That's a really important perspective to have. And I, and I like how it, it, it meshed well uh, with how the panel is going. Um, and, and, and thank you for your service. Um, and to all everyone who works on this issue, it's just a uh, um, uh, really important work. Um, the uh, next, I would like to uh, tell the audience that we're, we're going to go maybe 20 minutes over uh, to cover every question we can. I'd like to turn to Thomas Garofalo next with a directed question. What are the challenges of providing humanitarian assistance in detention centers and, di and disembarkation points? Um, well, I outlined a few of them a little bit earlier, uh, just the, the logistics of, uh, uh, of, of um, providing help to people that are in such, in such a vulnerable state. Um, I think that's, that's, uh, that's the main thing, but uh, I think it was uh, Dr. El Gassir who talked a bit about the, um, the crackdown in October, which uh, was extremely challenging for, for, uh, for the people that we try to serve among the migrant and refugee population. So many of the people um, who were swept up in this, uh, in this crackdown um, were people that we were providing assistance to and working with um, we have a number of community volunteers that we rely on to pass information out to the different communities that are at risk um, from the other nationalities that I mentioned earlier. Um, and many of them were actually swept up and arrested in quite a brutal and violent way and thrown into detention centers. Um, we had a, a, a young man who he and his wife and a newborn baby were um, were uh, detained in a situation where there were so many people that uh, they couldn't lie down, uh, that there weren't regular access to toilet facilities. So there was urine on the floor. Uh, they were um, cold. Uh, it was, you know, the weather was getting cold and rainy. Um, so, uh, and, and four other community uh, outreach personnel that we work with were also detained. And, and the, the last one of those, we only succeeded in having uh, released um, somewhat recently. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think that it's important also, um, I mean, we've, we're talking about the systemic issue. Um, what we have tried to advocate for as the International Rescue Committee uh, are things that are no, not easy by any means, but, but perhaps could be uh, a way to have um, some sort of improvement in the situation. And one of them that is, we think, absolutely critical is that there, there really has to be a return to a European search and rescue in the Mediterranean. Uh, it's clear from the other speakers that the Libyan Coast Guard is not um, capable uh, and has other limitations and, and um, is, not, is not really able to protect in any way the, the, the lives or the welfare of these people that are trying to cross the Mediterranean. It's really important that the European Union um, reestablishes that kind of capacity. I think Mark had mentioned this uh, that had existed earlier. Uh, and then on the ground, I mean, the narrative around the crackdown was that this was an anti-crime venture, that, the, that there were criminals, drug traffickers, et cetera, that were being arrested. Our experience is not, does not reflect that in the least. Uh, most of the people are simply working. They're part of the economy. Libya, like so many other countries, um, relies on this population for you know, um, 
construction, agriculture, uh, uh, retail uh, support, and and uh, and there is a place for them in the Libyan economy, and and it should be possible to um, to free them from the detention centers under some sort of a, a, a work permit scheme, and and this is something that has been done in other countries, and and frankly, UNHCR has tried to do that. Um, and try to negotiate that uh, with the Libyan authorities. Um, and UNHCR, we have to recognize, has, it, is really in a difficult position because of the things that uh, Dr. Elgassir was talking about. They don't have official status as, as a UN agency in, in, in Libya. And, um, and so they, they, uh, uh, they struggle really to provide services. Um, and the fact is there, we need more destinations for people who are uh, who are uh, asylum seekers in Libya to go. Um, there are very few places for them to go and, and all countries, not just European countries, although they certainly bear the most responsibility and, um, because of the, the geography, but, but uh, the United States as well, it's really good to see that the US government has increased the number of, of places for resettlement and for other pathways. Uh, uh, but that the, the numbers aren't sufficient to the people that are in need by any means. And there's um, something has to be done to change that math, basically, and to, and to allow that, including the, the repatriation flights that, that were mentioned and the resettlement flights. We also um, manage a small shelter in Misrata for people who have been cleared to leave uh, Libya to take to uh, have new lives in other countries. And the, the numbers are extremely small. There are, there are a couple of dozen people. Uh, there are thousands of people that need this kind of relief, and there's no way for them to get it until there are more options for resettlement. Thank you so much. And uh, one question for Ahmed Gassir. Um, how can Libyan authorities, UN bodies, and the international community address the lack of timely or transparent registration and review process of detainees? <laughs> Uh, I just uh, remark on uh, the, what uh, Thomas just said. Please. I mean, I, you know, I'm, it's, it's not a criticism for UNHCR. UNHCR in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bad situation because they are not recognized in Libya. And, 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 uh, and, and, and until there is something that the Libyan authorities settle and, you know, at least, you know, get, the, get a, 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 an agreement, memorandum of agreement that's so that they will be, come. for example, one of the issues is that registered refugees, that they should be, when they have this letter or this identification document, that they are a registered refugee, that at least they are not arrested, harassed, allowed. Uh, and, 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 you know, some, 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 some kind of uh, legal uh, status. This is important to, uh, for it. Uh, we, we understand that the Libyan authority have to have have to control the presence of 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 of, uh, of expats of uh, non nationals in its territory. Every every country must you know document people who are residing. Uh, the, we understand that. We understand that the Europeans are trying to to uh, you know to limit the flow of, of refugees to their to their territories. Uh, but at least, uh, you know, they have to also, but at least they have to respect international law. Don't return people to, to a country that is not safe for them. Don't support organizations that are not, you know, that they are, they are that they are, uh, there are, um, what do you call, evidence or suspicions that they are involved. For example, the head of the, uh, <clears throat> the head of the uh, Libyan Coast Guard in, in Azawiya, uh, Albija. I mean, th this guy is is on the sanctions list of the uh, of the uh, United Nations, uh, and still he's operating a uh, running a detention center where uh, people who are intercepted in the sea they are returned to his center. Now, uh, him and his 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 uh, his, uh, his uh, associates. Last month, last month. One Syrian refugee, among others, who were returned to a Zawiya center, Shahada al-Nasr, they were beaten. One of them was beaten on his head with, with, with a rod that killed him. And when, when his family, his siblings, uh, tried to uh, you know, ask for the body to give them, they, were, they refused. And, and his, uh, we don't know what happened to the body, buried in an unmarked uh, grave or something. So 
for the Europeans, we understand that they, they don't need, you know, they want to control the flow of the beer. But at least since you are a signatory to the, to the convention and its protocol, you have to respect the law. And you have to find a, a, a way of, of dealing uh, with this situation. And it is a priority because fighting this, this, this uh, human trafficking, these militias, they have they, they get money from from trafficking the persons uh, when they were released somebody is not only released until they pay a, a ransom or a, or a bribe to be released that's where the numbers uh, thomas that they are disappearing uh, because they are really you know they they buy their uh, their way out uh, many of them that's what the, the other thing is that the, for every number they report is detained they get a budget from the from the uh, from the authority uh, budget for supposedly that they are catering and uh, providing guards and whatever services, which is it. So the, the, the longer this, this, this goes on, the stronger these uh, gangs, these militias get stronger and it makes complications and it will hit back. This dirty money will hit us back. So it is a priority to fight it uh, for everybody, for the sake of everybody. So the U UNHCR and Libya, Libya, Libyan authorities have to come to agreement with the UNHCR and also maybe the United States can help in that, that, that it is respected. And it is not everybody, by the way, not every migrants in Libya are coming to Libya to go to Europe. I mean, the biggest community in Libya, expats in Libya migrants are from Niger. I think there, there are something like 150,000 according to the IOM. And when you look at the numbers of, of, of arrivals by sea in Italy, which is the main sort of like destination for people uh, embarking uh, on boats to, 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 to shore, you don't find Niger, people from uh, Niger, Niger nationalities there. You don't find them. They, 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 I haven't seen any numbers of them. They are very, very low among sort of like others. Most of the Ni people from Niger, they come and work in Libya. So find a, find a way of, of, of helping these people. The biggest number of people who arrive in Italy is, are Tunisians. Some of them, they live from, live from Tunisia directly. Some of them live from Libya. The second nationality this year, it's Bangladeshi. And they arrive in Libya legally. They don't cross borders. They don't walk across the borders. They arrive in Libya, and we are investigating this. They arrive in Libya legally through some uh, sort of like what they call uh, employment uh, companies. They come with the unemployment visa. They arrive in Libya. Some of them remain in Libya and work, but many of them uh, uh, go by sea. If you check the uh, numbers of, yeah, of the arrivals in in, in uh, in, uh, in uh, Italy by sea, you'll find the second biggest nationality is Bangladeshi. That, and then you have the Egyptians. And then you have Syrians. This year, we have seen a large number of Syrians arriving. Uh, also, they arrive in Libya legally. They arrive in Libya with, with, the, with the, what they call uh, security clearance. They arrive via uh, Benina Airport. There are, I think, a, double, uh, a couple of flights by Sham Air, La, Air Wings every week. Uh, they arrive. We are investigating this as well. Uh, and so, can I jump in with questions or yeah. not yet? Uh, uh, this is what I'm saying. I mean, we have to, we understand all the constraints. Every country has, you know, every party has its own sort of like needs to do. But you have to also respect the needs and the life of these people. And it is a priority now because one thing is that this is the, 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 these are human beings that they are suffering. The other is that these organized uh, uh, gangs that they are. I, I, I don't know, so something like 5 billion, according to the, uh, to the Europol, for uh, I think in 2016, it was like 5 billion euros they made just by transporting people across the Mediterranean. That This money goes back into crim criminal activity. Sorry, Doris, I interrupted you. I know. Um, well, I appreciate that the panelists are answering the audience questions sort of as we go, but I'm going to try to get to some audience questions now. 
Uh, we're going to go a little over, maybe not the full 20 minutes, but I'm going to try to get to as many audience questions as I can. Um, I would like to thank um, the audience people who are um, putting comments in the chat and in the Q&A. And I recommend that everybody take a look at the comments in the chat in the UNA because we're not going to turn those around as questions, but there's a lot of great information and eyewitness uh, info, uh, accounts of things going on there. I'd like to just turn it briefly to Ramdan, who's asked to ask a question and, and ask him to ask one brief question and direct it, his best question to a panel member. Ramdan? Is he there? Yeah, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, one question to a panel member, please. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, to the panel and for Libyan American Alliance for this conference. I, I have a comment and then I just wanna hear your comment. Um, my 86 year old father-in-law lives with me. He has heart problems and health issues and I wouldn't, think to go in and say, hey, how come you didn't plow the snow or do the or do the, the yard today? Libya has been struggling for 11 years with very unstable government. My father-in-law, I'm talking about, got kidnapped for over two weeks. People are getting kidnapped for uh, ransoms. I lost three of my relatives. Two of my nephews were injured. These are facts. Libya is a very unstable country. And when you have unstable country, you know that these kind of criminal activities are gonna occur. So my comment is unless Libya is stabilized and unless the international community help Libya stabilized, I don't really foresee helping these refugees. And unfortunately, it is a very sad situation. It really truly sad and a horrible situation. But also Libyans are suffering from within by, own, by their own people. My doctor told me, you listen, when you get on a plane, what do they tell you about if there's an emergency? When the masks come down, you put your mask, your, your own mask first, then you try to help your kids and others. So unless we are in, in, a, in a good condition, unless we are stabilized, I don't see who's gonna help those poor refugees who come to Libya knowing that Libya is a mess. So I just would like to hear that, please. Your right, comments yeah. is very wonderful. Yeah, I'd like to thank you for a very important heartfelt comment and, um, and, and, and add to the comment that um, we're all in the same boat. That's my, that's my response. Uh, the, the metaphor won't be lost on you. Um, uh, and, and, I, and I'll invite the panelists afterwards to comment on, on your comment if they'd like. Ismael, could I ask you um, to ask a question to a panelist? Hi, Bill, nice, nice to see everyone. Thank you for this insightful uh, event uh, to those involved with it. So my question is, is pretty much in line really with this Mr. Ramadan just stated. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, at, at my bird home and I'm seeing basically a state who, who basically scores high in the fragility index and practically a failed state. So, you know, Despite that, the international community seems to be forcing the nation into uh, uh, basically a, a baseless or foundationless um, elections uh, with no constitution, no roadmap, no security on the ground, no rule of law to, to basically make sure that the elections have any form of transparencies or honesty or, 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 or that is one angle. On the other side, we all know and mindful that coming years is going to bring economic, basically refugees, ramifications of rising temperatures, climate, basically refugees who are going to go through any failed state. So we see Libya, the future, giving the lack of foundation for its selection as really kind of uh, and resolvable, more like a, a perpetual problems moving forward towards Europe. So my question is, what is what are the European policies? What are the roles of just the West in general? What, what, what are the policy in place to basically 
look forward a little bit ahead and consider the climate crisis and maybe do something in the meantime, because as Mr. Ramadan said, Libya is a failed state. What are the community are going to do policy-wise to try to mitigate this issue? Thank you. Thank you, Ismail. I'm gonna bring in some more questions from the audience from the Q&A. Um, uh, the first one is from Yambio David Oliver, a survivor. Uh, what does Thomas Garofalo mean when he says there seems to be no way out for the migrants uh, trapped in Libya? Is Italy and EU member states, are Italy and EU member states not responsible for these? Are they not the ones funding the so-called Libyan Coast Guards and its militias? Um, skipping over some comments. Uh, I saw another question here. Um, yes. Um, about 900 of us have stayed in Libya for five years, but instead of giving us priority, this is from Fevin Seltin, uh, instead of giving us priority, they give us attention to those that stay two to three months for the process. What is our verdict and why is it that uh, we all can't leave at the same time or leave on a first come, first serve basis? Another comment for the whole panel, um, and you can choose which ones you uh, re respond to. There are some refugees who already had their interviews, but didn't receive any info about their status for two years. Um, and there are, uh, there are those who have been rejected. What kinds of solutions do we expect for these refugees? I'd like to go in the same order as before um, and, and, and invite Mark um, to address any of the questions and comments. I'd like to say I, I agree, especially with uh, there were um, a couple of comments concerning the, the the condition of Libya right now and and what can be expected of Libya, um, uh, and and also in the context of of the ridiculous international pressure to 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 hold these elections in 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 on the twenty fourth of December, um, or or any time in, in in the next couple of months, unless the the conditions that were mentioned. Are, are met, um, it's clear that elections are going to be harmful for, for Libya and not, and not um, positive. And I go back to the comment I, I made. In the current state, Libya is in, um, with so many armed and empowered uh, armed actors um, that are frankly holding um, much of the Libyan population um, uh, uh, up to ransom, basically. Um, yes, it is up to to the international community to to intervene, but intervene with a, a, a coherent plan, which currently um, doesn't exist. And and where it exists, it's fickle. Um, and and the example of how the international community has been, or part of the international community, has been pressing irrationally for for these elections without first um, uh, 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 ensuring the, 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 the really basic conditions that have been mentioned, uh, 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 a sound constitution that has uh, uh, buy-in, um, uh, 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 stability on the ground, and, and the situation that, that uh, where, where an election result can be um, uh, defended, if, if it needs to be defended, um, uh, and uh, and and the process that that uh, that everyone can have can have confidence in and 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 you know a, a, a role that everyone can have uh, confidence in. Before these conditions are are met, I agree obviously that an election is important. But before these conditions are met, having an election in these conditions um, will do more harm than good. And. Uh, and 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 these are the basics that that need to be tackled. Everything else comes later. The political question is always the fundamental question um, in 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 Libya's current situation. Thank you so much, Mark, for those cogent and thoughtful comments. Before I turn to Thomas, I'm going to ask the last question. That's a question in the Q and A uh, for the for the remaining panelists um, uh, and. Uh, the rest are comments. I again encourage the group to look at them. Uh, my question is how can we enhance and push the international community initiatives towards these countries, including Libya as well, for more economic startups and also scale up the communications at all levels of the smuggling misdemeanor slash crime that all national and international laws are addressing it as a crime. 
Uh, and I'll turn to Thomas to address any of the comments and questions from the audience. Thank you. I mean, uh, I, the, the questions are, are really excellent. I, and I um, just to pick up on what, what Mark was saying, I, many people say that Libya is a failed state. We hear that more and more frequently. Other people identify Libya as a middle income country with enormous wealth and potential, and both are right. And this is the challenge without a, a bedrock of, of, uh, of law and, and uh, without unifying the country um, through, through governance measures, it, it's, it's hard to see how things can, can progress. And I, I'm not a political expert and I don't tend to talk about the, the political side in Libya, we're a humanitarian agency. Um, but the level of attention given to the process of elections hasn't been as much as it has been on the dead on the deadline uh, of the 24th of December, and it's really clear that that is we're running into reality now, where we're not go, we're likely not to see, not going to see elections. Um, I, I would say that there is I'm a humanitarian, and we have to have hope. Um, what we have seen in working with the Ministry of Health is a tremendous willingness to be accepting and welcoming of non-Libyans, not in every place uh, and not uniformly, but like in any country, there are, there are strong points that really need to be supported and built out. Uh, we have been working on health, public health system strengthening now for a couple of years, and, and this funding is coming from the European Union. Um, and and the, the point of the funding is to, is to be able to support the public health system to address public health emergencies, um, and primary health care, as well as secondary and tertiary. And the, the, this is an issue you can't, you can't put borders around. You can't say that you will only do public health for Libyans. And what we have found in working with Libyan health institutions is that they are very willing to, to make sure that everyone is covered by, by public health in Libya. And that's something that doesn't get a lot of attention out of the country. We talk, we talk a great deal about conflict in Libya, and that's accurate. There is a conflict in Libya. That's why people refer to it as a failed state so often. But um, with sustained assistance, we can build on those strong points and, and, and expand from there. Um, and I have found that the Libyans that we work with, as I'm sure Mark would agree, are enormously uh, hospita hospitable and hopeful about that. Um, when I say that there's no way out, I, I agree with the questioner. There aren't enough places for uh, people to, to find uh, safety and peace. Um, it's sad, but the fact is that not everyone who is, is seeking asylum will be granted asylum. And we have to face that hard fact too. Um, that's why so many people elect to go back to their home country through these IOM flights, or they, they are qualified legally to go to these um, other transit mechanisms in Rwanda, um, I think in Niger, um, and we have to vastly ramp up these, uh, these pathways. And that includes countries like the United States and, and European countries to vastly increase the number of people they're willing to accept. Because this problem will get worse as the other questioners were mentioning. Well, climate change issue is, is really driving a lot of the migration to Libya now. And that is not going to improve soon. So we have to build on the strong points in Libya. It's possible to do that. It needs investment. I would also say that it can only be a developmental question. Uh, because that's where most of the funding coming to Libya is going now, but there is there remains a humanitarian dimension of this, including in Libyans who are still displaced. Displaced. It's gotten much better in the last year because of peace in Libya, relative peace. But there needs to be flexible funding given to to Libya. We need to support the Libyans to build these systems. They can't do it alone, and we have to be uh, we have to be a good partner to them to resolve. Uh, the issue of, of, of migration in Libya and help them to do that in more than just a punitive way. Ahmed, I'd like to invite you to uh, briefly address uh, any of the comments uh, that you would like to address, and then we're going to move to the conclusion. Just like, uh, sorry, you know, sorry, comments and questions, particularly the questions. <laughs> uh, I mean, I mean, you know, the, 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 the situation in Libya, we recognize it. It's, it's, it's a, a, a uh, the the uh, the, uh, the political divisions, the the militias, the proliferation of weapons, uh, and all that situation, we are recognize it, and we recognize as well that that Libya is not the cause of migration. Libya is not the uh, the source of. I mean, up to now, it's not the source of migration. People find the you know the, the, why it has increased uh, the transit. Libya is a, a transit country. 
because of the lawlessness, because of the of the breakdown of law and order, because of the the you know the the uh, these gangs, uh, this this uh, this uh, human trafficking uh, 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 networks, which are transnational, they find it an easy territory to operate through it. But we uh, and we're not blaming Libya for this. I am a Libyan. We were not, we, you know, and, and we're here today, we are meeting to discuss the situation of the migrants. If you want to talk, it is a priority to stabilize Libya, because then when you have a law enforcement, when you have a law and order, then you will have, you will control these gangs and you will make it difficult for them to operate. But when we're talking here, when, you know, it, the solution that Europe is finding is that to try to you know, prevent them from crossing. And even in the process, breaking its own obligations to international law by returning, forcing them. This is, has worsened the situation. For the Libyan government, yes, it's not, it's not the sole responsibility for the, the, the increased number for, of migrants, but it is now it's a problem. People are stranded there. For a year, they have blocked the flights. And we know why. And we, we, we called them them. We wrote to them, we wrote to the authorities, we say to them, investigate this and call, you know, name the culprits. Yeah, but I mean, you know, we know that the culprits is protected by militias. So they delayed it for a whole year, blocked the flights and did not address this and it created this, uh, this situation. The other thing is that you can't uh, generalize by just carrying out mass arrests. As I said, there are some people who are you know, uh, not respecting the law and may engage in or might have engaged in, 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 in criminal activities, but they are the minority. At least what's, how we see it on the ground, how our, our, our researchers on the ground see it there. So Libya is not the source, it's not the cause of the problem. Libya is a transit country. You have the source countries and you have the destination countries. They have to come together into an agreement how to solve this, at least for the transitional period until situation in Libya improves what we can do on the humanitarian side. That is what needs to be addressed. It's not, you know, throwing the, uh, the problem on the, Libyan, uh, on the Libyans and say, you have to, you have to, you know, you have to deal with it. I, I you know, I hope that I've made the, the, the point clear. It's not, you know, we did not discuss this, the, the, you know, the situation in Libya because we are talking about just one issue, the migrants. If you want to talk about the political situation, why that the, the, the breakdown and why this uh, uh, impasse uh, and the, 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 the political process that has, has worsened the situation in Libya since 2014, instead of improving, it has gone down. Yes, the last two years, uh, since uh, June, uh, not last year actually, since June 2020, when the when the uh, when the uh, for, uh, militias or forces of the of, of Hefter retreated, and where you know the, the attack on Tripoli was rebelled, uh, and they retreated, and and there has been a sort of like you know a ceasefire. Uh, yes, it has improved the situation. This uh, the but is this, is it ready for a political uh, uh, solution now? Imposing and hurry, rushing into a, a, a what they call elections. I don't know. I mean, I mean, I don't see it that way. So I hope that it's be clear for the. Uh, it's, when I say it's a priority addressing the human trafficking, it doesn't mean that we have to stop everything and, and else and do. It. But it's uh, but you can't also ignore it because ignoring it is what's what's that's in, you know increase in influence and size. It's a problem. Well, I've come away from this panel believing we need a Berlin process for migrants <laughs> in, in, in Libya, as well as a Berlin process. You know, if you look up failed state, it's a failed state. Libya does not meet the, most of the criteria for a failed state. It's a divided state, not a failed state. But it's a completely failed state when it comes to the migration issue, um, as well evidenced by all the comments we had today. Um, and, 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 you know, often when people talk about, um, can you hear me? It said it was unstable, but am I clear? Um, uh, when, when about Libya, they talk about it 
uh, as a tabula rasa starting in 2011, as if Libya had no institutions, as if Libya had nothing but the dictator, as if Libya uh, uh, had, had no problems that, that pre-existed. And if this panel has taught us anything, Libya had a lot institutionally and in terms of challenges prior to 2011, and then everything got worse. Um, and if, if we've learned anything today also, it's that the militias are going nowhere. There's no DDR, no S coming anytime soon. Uh, 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 and we have to problematize and nuance our discussion of every governing structure and every institution in Libya, because it's not, but it's all failing. And the international community is failing the migrants and the Libyan people uh, on a regular basis. I hope my friend Stephanie Williams can can, can make some ground in the coming weeks and Libyan people and can take things back a little bit uh, in, in the coming weeks as well. Um, uh, I'd like to thank the panelists for the best discussion of Libyan migration I've uh, seen on, on, uh, on Libya. Um, and I've participated in quite a few and I'd like to turn things back over to Natasha and Fatima for a brief con concluding remark on behalf of the Libyan American law. I'm sorry, we're a little over time, but I do want to say thank you so much to our incredible panel. It's been so amazing to have you here and to our amazing moderator as well and for, for your insight, Dr. Lawrence. Um, we're really grateful for all of your time. Um, I also want to thank the attendees for being here today with us. Um, and we really hope to keep the momentum going on this issue. And we really hope to, to host more events and initiatives around this issue. Uh, so keep an eye out and thank you so much and have a great evening slash morning slash uh, afternoon, wherever you're from. And be in touch with us. This conversation is not over. Thank you. Thank everybody. you everybody. Thank you for thank a great you. discussion. Thank you. Thank you for more questions. Bye.